athletes, welcome to another special Team Iron Cowboy presentation. I'm your host, Matt Fitzgerald, Team Iron Cowboy coach and author of Racing Weight. Today's webinar topic is Get Leaner, Go Faster, Five Steps to Your Optimal Racing Weight. Here's an overview of the ground we'll cover. We're going to start by talking about why weight and body composition matter to endurance performance. Uh, then we will take a moment to define your optimal racing weight and how to determine it. Uh, then I will introduce the important com com concept excuse me, of performance weight management. Uh, and then we'll get down to the practical stuff, five steps to reach your optimal racing weight. Okay, so sometimes scientists go out and they prove the obvious. I think every endurance athlete knows that uh, being lean and light um, benefits performance. Uh, mainly because uh, when you don't carry a lot of excess body fat, uh, you move more efficiently. Uh, but there are also subtler reasons. Uh, for example, leaner athletes tend to be better at uh, burning fat, ironic though that may seem. Uh, and there are other uh, minor physiological advantages that add up to a big performance advantage to being lean. And scientists, yes, have gone out and proven this uh, fact that we all know. Uh, the table on the left shows the results of a study done back in the 80s by British researchers, they took a large and diverse group of runners and based on their uh, personal best times at, I believe, the 10K distance, they divided them into three groups, average runners, good runners, and elite runners. And you can see actually all of these runners were you know, fairly light. The, the average runners were 152 pounds, good runners 145, elite runners uh, 141 pounds, and then body fat levels were 12.1% for average runners. 10.7% for good and 8.0 for elite. Uh, so you see there's a clear correlation here with, um, although uh, you know, even the average runners in this study were fairly light and lean, uh, you know, the, the better an athlete performed at 10K, the more likely they were to be lighter and leaner. Um, that's all to be expected. What you might not expect is that this pattern continues uh, even if you look inside uh, the top 1%, as it were, within a population of elite runners, the leanest are still tend to be the fastest. Um, this was shown, the, the graph on your right uh, uh, presents the results of a study involving elite Ethiopian runners. These were middle distance runners. Um, and uh, there are 11 men and 10 women in the study. And basically what, they were, what the scientists who conducted the study did is they, they lined these runners up statistically according to their body fat level. It was actually the sum of their skin fold measurements, the caliper method for estimating body fat percentage. So they, they lined them up from fattest to skinniest, though these were all elite runners, so they were all very lean. Uh, then they scrambled them and statistically lined them up according to their best times over the 1500 meter distance, these were middle distance runners. Um, and what they found was these two lineups, one in terms of body fat percentage and the second in terms of uh, performance at 1500 meters were almost identical. Uh, so all, although these runners were all fast and all lean, the fastest one was the leanest one, the slowest one was the least lean, and it was almost a perfect order as you can see. Uh, the way the, uh, the individual results are product, plotted along this line, uh, that uh, body fat percentage, even among elite athletes, was as predictive of performance as uh, a more traditional physiological variable such as VO2 max. So it really does pay at all levels of performance uh, to be lean as an endurance athlete. Uh, here's a couple more studies that, that drive home the same point uh, in other endurance disciplines. Uh, the graph on the left is from a study done in 2015 that looked at body fat percent, the, 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 excuse me, the relationship between body fat percentage and peak power in cyclists. So, you know, peak power is uh, an anaerobic performance measure. So it's, you know, it's the, the maximum number of watts you can crank out when you're going as hard as you can, um, which is, you know, not the most important thing for an endurance athlete to be able to do, but still important. And even in that anaerobic uh, performance variable, uh, there was a relationship between body fat percentage and peak power. So the leaner athletes among um, cyclists uh, tend to be able to produce the highest power even uh, at the highest intensities, not just in, in time trial type efforts. 
uh, and then the study on, on the right uh, is uh, from 2011, and it looked at the relationship between body fat percentage and Ironman split times. So a large group of triathletes who were set to participate, I want to say in Ironman Switzerland or, or Ironman Zurich, whatever they call it, um, they uh, had their body fat percentages measured before the competition. And then after the competition, the, the scientists conducting the study uh, looked at their split times in the swim, the bike, and the run. And this was a good uh, way to see if and how much body fat percentage influenced performance, performance in each separate discipline in a triathlon. And as you can see from the results on the right, uh, the, uh, the impact was almost identical in all three. Um, so a, what a correlation coefficient is, uh, it, it just measures, it's a measure of how strongly um, one uh, input was associated with another output. It doesn't necessarily demonstrate causation, but statistically where there's smoke, there's always fire. Um, and a correlation coefficient of uh, 3, 0.35, 0.36, what you're, what, you're, what you're seeing here is classified as moderate. So if you saw a correlation of say 1.0, which would be the maximum between uh, swim split time in an Ironman and body fat percentage, that would mean that your swim split time varied in direct proportion to uh, changes in body fat percentage, which would basically mean that body fat percentage was the only thing that mattered for swim performance. Clearly, that's not the case here. 0.35 rather than 1.0 is moderate. Uh, correlation of 0.00, .00 would mean there was absolutely no relationship at all. So what we find is that there's a, you know, a moder moderate correlation between body fat percentage and performance in all three triathlon disciplines, which means that it's an important factor, but not the only factor uh, for performance, which again, kind of confirms common sense. So we've established that uh, you know, attaining your optimal body weight is performance, your optimal racing weight. Um, is critical to performance, but how do you know what your optimal racing weight is? It's important, this is an important point to drive home that um, optimal racing weight is functionally determined. And what that means is you can't know what your ideal body fat percentage and weight are for maximum performance as an endurance athlete, except by achieving it. You need to train right, eat right, do everything right to get to the maximum fitness level you can possibly attain and basically on the morning when you have the best race of your life, that is your optimal racing weight. And there's no way to predict it with 100% accuracy ahead of time. Nevertheless, it can be helpful in terms of goal setting to try. Um, so you know, really in terms of a formula, as you see in the screen, what determines your, your optimal racing weight uh, is your current lean body mass um, divided by your optimal body fat percentage. Um, so you need to know what these things are in order to make a, a reasonably accurate estimate of what your optimal racing weight is. So the reason current lean body mass uh, is part of the equation is that unless you are a, a former recent bodybuilder who's carrying a lot of excess uh, muscle mass, then probably the amount of lean body mass on your body, which is everything except body fat, is not going to change. Uh, what separates you uh, from the weight you're at now uh, from your optimal racing weight, uh, if you're like most endurance athletes, is excess body fat percentage. So in the process of going from where you are now to achieving your optimal racing weight, what you're looking to do is lose excess body, mat, uh, bo excess body fat and hold on to bone density, uh, body water, uh, and muscle. Uh, so that's the formula. I've tried to make it easy. Uh, uh, there's an online calculator that kind of does this for you. You put in a few inputs because there are other factors that, that determine uh, you know, what your optimal body fat percentage is. Um, that um, you know, It's highly individual. It varies by gender, varies by age, varies by genetics, varies by uh, your weight history. If you've ever been obese in the fast, then the lowest realistically healthy Body, body fat percentage you can attain is not going to be the same as if you've always been lean. So that's a bit on, on how to do, figure out what your optimal racing weight is. So it's important to uh, underscore another point here, which is uh, 
So even if you know absolutely with absolute certainty what your optimal racing weight is, uh, which again is really defined by your lowest realistically attainable healthy body fat percentage, um, even if you already know what that number is, um, getting to those numbers isn't necessarily going to result in the best possible possible performance because there are different ways to lose body fat uh, and some are better than others. Um, and what research has found uh, is that uh, the goals of uh, maximizing performance and the goal of losing excess, excess body fat as quickly as possible are, are incompatible. In other words, the best possible way, the most effective way to lose excess body fat um, is actually not the best way to lose excess body fat as an endurance athlete unless uh, you're during the off season and you're not worried about building fitness. Um, and it's, you know, it's pretty easy to understand why this is the case because the most effective way to lose excess body fat rapidly is to starve yourself, is to just eat way fewer calories than, than you need to sustain your current body fat level. Well, if you do that, yes, you will lose body fat quickly, but your performance will be completely undermined. Um, so it really matters how you go about trying to attain your optimal racing weight. There are good ways and bad ways to do it. And the results of this study that are summarized in this table uh, here you know, prove that point. Uh, this study was done by William Lunn and colleagues at Southern Connecticut State University in 2009. And what they did is they took a group of cyclists and they divided them uh, into three groups, actually four, but the control group is not uh, shown in this, in this study. So they took uh, some of these cyclists and they added high intensity intervals to their training uh, in order to increase their fitness level. Um, then they took another group and they kept their training the same, but they reduced their daily caloric intake in order to get them to lose weight. Um, and then they took a third group and they did both. They added high intensity intervals to their training to increase fitness, and they also reduced their calorie intake uh, in order to get them to lose weight. And then they looked at the effect of um, uh, the effect of these different changes on their body fat levels um, and their uh, sustained power output. So they looked to see you know, how effective these measures were at actually reducing their body weight uh, and or increasing the amount of power they could put out their performance. So you can see when intervals were added, um, the athletes who added in intervals actually did lose some body fat, even though that wasn't the main purpose of doing so, and they increased their power output a lot. So they, the, the intervals in, succeeded in increasing their power output, output more than any of the inter, other interventions did. Then you take the calorie reduction group, those who ate less uh, in order to uh, lose body fat. Um, they also lost some body fat, as was to be expected, um, but they did not lose the most body fat out of the three groups. We'll get to that. Um, and they also actually did increase uh, their power output, um, but um, not as much as those uh, who added intervals to their training. Uh, and then the third group, which combined the addition of intervals with calorie reduction, you know, you would think based on uh, the results of the other two groups, uh, you know, intervals provided benefits, calorie reduction provided benefits. So you might think that doing both, the benefits would be additive, uh, but that wasn't the case at all. In fact, um, the combination of intervals and calorie reduction resulted in the most body fat loss. However, uh, that group also gained the least power. They basically didn't gain any power output at all. And in fact, this combined group was the only group that saw no improvement in their power to weight ratio, which is a, a critical measure of performance capacity in cycling. Uh, so this is really proof that trying to increase your fitness as much as possible and trying to lose as much weight as possible, uh, they're conflicting goals because one undercuts the other. Uh, adding intervals increases your, your energy needs so if you're reducing your energy supply at the same time by eating less, you're not able to benefit from that additional training and you end up going nowhere. So performance weight management is my term for the right way to go about um, 
uh, losing excess body fat in order to actually a- achieve better performance because there are ways of losing excess body fat that will either have a neutral effect on your performance or actually worsen your performance. So let's talk about you know five steps that uh, fall under this umbrella of the you know the right way to pursue uh, performance weight management. The first is to increase your diet quality. Diet quality is an extremely important concept that simply does not get talked about enough. People are so obsessed with macronutrients, what's the right balance of carbs, fats, and proteins, um, uh, that they completely overlook something that is uh, actually exceedingly more important, which is diet quality. In, In the study of nutritional epidemiology, diet quality, that concept is used all the time. And what nutritional epidemiology does is in large populations, scientists look for correlations between dietary patterns and disease risk. So for example, they'll take 10,000 men and women and uh, assess how often they eat fruit. Uh, And then they'll track these people over time and they will look at the incidence of say, pancreatic cancer, just to throw something random out there. And they will look to see if people who eat more fruit have a lower or higher risk of, of pancreatic cancer and if people who eat uh, less fruit or no fruit have a higher or lower risk for pancreatic cancer, that sort of thing. And what scientists have found is that um, it's not any particular food or food type uh, that makes the biggest difference uh, in health outcomes in, in you know, large populations of people. It's this concept of diet quality, which is a diet that includes lots of all of the healthy whole food types and not a lot of you know, the unhealthy processed food types. So a diet that is high in overall quality seems to be the best for overall health. And overall health is the foundation for endurance performance. You know, uh, endurance fitness is really just kind of like hyper health. Um, it's more of all the same. If you're, if you're super endurance fit, you, know, you just have more of all the same things that make a, a, a non-athlete just, just plain healthy. Um, so the, you know, the foundation of a diet for optimal racing weight um, is a diet that is high in quality uh, because all of the, of the high quality food types tend to be slimming. Uh, people who eat each of the high quality food types tend to be leaner than those who, who don't eat them or who, or, or who eat less of them. And people who eat more of the low quality food types uh, tend to be fatter than people who eat less of them. So in, in uh, my system for categorizing foods by type, I've got 10 basic categories. And in this table, I've arranged them in descending order of quality. So vegetables are the highest quality food type. Fried foods, fruits, fried foods, fried foods, thank you, are the lowest quality food type. Um, so uh, if you want to increase your diet quality for the sake of uh, pursuing your optimal racing weight, what you basically want to do is eat the highest quality food types, the ones, uh, fruits and vegetables, which are essential in my classification, the foods that everyone, uh, every endurance athlete, every human being should eat. Um, you want to eat those food types more often, more frequently than any of the others. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the most calories from those foods because they're extremely low in caloric density, especially vegetables, but that you're just having more frequent servings of them than you are of anything else. And then there's kind of a recommended category, foods that um, I strongly recommend that you include in your diet unless you have, you know, uh, kind of a religious or ethical reason um, or an allergy-based reason not to eat them. But this should be your starting point is to also eat uh, nuts, seeds, and healthy oils, whole grains, dairy, and that's uh, that's whole milk dairy, whole food, uh, full fat dairy. Uh, believe it or not, the research shows that full fat dairy is good for you. Low fat dairy um, is neutral, neither good nor bad. And then unprocessed meat and seafood is also in the recommended category. So you should eat those types of foods uh, more often than all of the foods that are in the six, uh, acceptable or low quality classification. I say acceptable because I'm completely against rules that forbid people from ever eating any food type. If you look at the most successful endurance athletes in the world, all of them eat at least some of these low quality acceptable foods, refined grains, processed meat, sweets, and fried foods. They just don't eat a lot of them. Uh, So there is such a thing as a good enough diet. 
a diet that is mostly high quality foods, uh, but does include low quality foods, um, is going to be just as good as, as one that only includes uh, high quality foods and, and has no low, low quality foods what, uh, whatsoever. It's what uh, James Lawrence, the Iron Cowboy, calls a B plus diet. Really, uh, a B plus diet is going to give you the same results as an A plus diet, but anything below B plus is go going to really start to harm you as an endurance athlete. So those acceptable low quality foods, you want to eat them less often than you eat any of the uh, higher ranked food types. Um, I actually have an app. Uh, it's a, the Diet Quality Score app, DQS app, uh, which is a really simple tool that allows you uh, to um, accurately quantify the, the overall quality of your diet. And it's really useful to use. It's much easier than food journaling or calorie countering or anything like that. Um, and it's because most of us, we look through our own diet with rose colored glasses. Everyone thinks they have a high quality diet. Few people actually do. Uh, so if you use this tool, you can no longer lie to yourself. Um, and it makes it really easy to systematically try to improve your diet quality score. The point of this is not to attain a perfect or maximal diet quality score. Uh, you can get to 35. I've never measured the diet quality of a world-class endurance athlete that reached that number. So it's simply not necessary. Uh, but incrementally increasing your diet quality score using this tool um, to the level where you are getting the results you want um, is uh, one important way to uh, attain your optimal racing weight and peak performance. Step two, the second way to pursue optimal racing weight is to eat mindfully. So we talked about quantity of food intake. Obviously, uh, sorry, we're talking about quality. Quantity also matters. Um, in, in this society, uh, most people eat too much. So we tend to be hyper-conscious of the problem of overeating. But uh, for endurance athletes, eating too little is, although not quite as common, it's much more common than it is in the, you know, the general population of, of overweight people. And you really want to avoid either. If you eat too much, obviously you're gonna carry excess body fat that increases the energy cost of swimming, cycling, running, whatever. And if you eat too little, you're not gonna have enough energy to train optimally or to recover properly from training. You're more likely to get injured. So there, there are all kinds of problems associated with eating too little as well. So how do you eat the right amount? Uh, the good news is that the, the most reliable way to consistently eat the right amount of, amount of food is to go by appetite, just to go by feel. Um, it works much better than uh, trying to you know, you know, calculate how many calories you need and then count calories all day, every day uh, to thread that needle. That process is notoriously inaccurate. Um, whereas the ap human appetite control mechanism is built in it's the result of millions of years of evolution. Your body knows how much food you need. Uh, the reason so many people feel uh, they buy into the myth that you can't trust your appetite. And most people think if you, if you eat as much as you want to, you're bound to overeat. That's simply not true. It's simply, but it is true in our current context, uh, which is one of uh, it's, you know, an obesogenic, obesogenic uh, food environment we occupy where food is cheap, plentiful, and tasty. So the inducements to overeat are, are many. Um, but what research shows is that human infants, uh, until the age of, of about to uh, toddlerhood, um, they, they determine how much they eat by their, their own inbuilt appetite control, control signals. So they eat mindfully. An infant can't count calories. Um, or you know, measure portions. They just uh, cry when they're hungry to request food. And when they're, uh, they've had enough food, they just stop eating. They, they spit out that next bite. So we all have this ability. And if you look at the animal kingdom, you know, every type of animal you can imagine knows how much to eat. You, know, you don't see uh, you know, obese lions. Uh, so they're all using the same tool. Lions are not counting calories or measuring portions. They're simply eating when they're hungry and not eating when they're not. Uh, and that is the way to uh, get to your optimal racing weight. Uh, the trouble is um, around toddlerhood in, in uh, uh, wealthy societies like ours, we're basically culturally taught to overeat because uh, we're served portions of food that are larger uh, than we need. And once you uh, kind of lose touch with simply listening to your true uh, hunger and satiety signals, 
then no longer you can, you can rely on them. So eating mindfully is about getting back in touch with those signals so that you can trust your appetite again. Um, so eating mindfully, you know, the first, the first part is to distinguish physical hunger from mental hunger. So physical hunger is that, that empty feeling in the stomach, the rumbling in the, in the belly, and also that feeling of you know, declining blood glucose levels where your sort of mental and physical energy is declining. When you feel those symptoms, that is your body telling you that you actually need, need food. Mental hunger is simply... It would be a nice idea to eat that donut uh, that my coworker just brought in to share with the office, even though I just had a bowl of oatmeal two hours ago. So in a situation like that where you're tempted to eat, but your stomach is not rumbling, that's mental hunger. And the reason so many people, or one of the main reasons so many people in our society are overweight is because they eat uh, from mental hunger rather than physical hunger uh, all the time. Uh, so, so it's just a matter of it takes a little practice, but research shows it's, it's very doable. Uh, you just kind of step back from yourself and, and when you're considering eating at any point, you ask yourself, am I physically hungry or am I simply mentally hungry? The great thing about this practice is that you're, you're not required to go hungry. Um, you're required to skip snacks and meals that you simply don't need because you're not hungry, but this is a practice that, that does not demand that you go to bed with a rumbling stomach. Anytime you're physically hungry, uh, you are allowed to and encouraged to eat, but you need to put down the fork before you're overstuffed uh, and then wait until you're physically hungry again to eat again. So uh, eat when you're physically hungry uh, and then don't restrict calories and portions. Uh, what the research shows on people who um, have a high level of what's called eating restraint is that they tend to eat less than they need uh, sometimes, and then they tend to overeat other times. They pinball back and forth because what happens is uh, when you restrict calories, and I, I encounter a lot of athletes, especially very weight conscious female endurance athletes who you know, they're afraid to eat more even when they're training more. So they get to the point where their training means they need to eat a certain number of calories. Their rules about uh, calorie intake uh, set a ceiling that's lower than that, so they're hungry. Uh, and any human being can only put up with being hungry for so long before they snap and binge. So the highly restricted eaters tend to do just that. They yo-yo or pinball back and forth between uh, eating not enough one day, then binging and overeating the next, or it could happen in weekly or monthly cycles. The point is, people who, athletes who try to uh, eat the right amount uh, using math or uh, you know eat any type of type of eating restraint, they are much less likely to actually eat the right amount of food consistently. Consistently, it's the athletes who become good at eating mindfully, trusting their body signals. Those are the ones uh, that do a good job of eating mind, uh, mindfully. And the last point here: avoid mindless eating. Mindless eating uh, is a term coined by a research, researcher uh, named Brian Wansink, who's done a lot of studies just proving that. Um, one of the reasons that Americans and other people in wealthy societies overeat beca is because um, they eat mindlessly, which is like sitting in front of a screen and just you know finishing an entire bottle of chip, a bottle bag of chips, um, just because it's there. So you know maybe you're hungry when you have the first chip, but you're no longer hungry after you've had the tenth, and yet you continue eating because you're just not paying attention. Uh, plate cleaning or plate clearing is another example of mindless eating. You go to a restaurant, you're served way more food than you need, uh, but you finish it just because it's there. You know, um, so what you should do is you know eat as much as you're actually physically hungry for, then put down the fork, put the rest in a doggy bag, and take that home. So enough on mindless eating. Let's move on to step three here, which is to practice nutrient timing. Uh, so uh, when you eat is almost as important as what you eat, especially as an endurance athlete. Um, so th this is this is pretty simple. You know, there was a, a fad uh, or a phase for a while that uh, was all about grazing. The idea that if you ate uh, small meals or snacks uh, every two or three hours, you would rev up your metabolism and get leaner that way. That turned out to be a myth based on nothing. It's, it's just not true. You're actually more, the, the more often you eat, the more likely you are to overeat. Uh, unless you are uh, one of these you know, elite level athletes who's burning an incredible amount of calories and basically needs to eat uh, many times a day in order to meet their highly elevated 
energy needs. So a basic, the, the way to start with uh, nutrient timing is uh, just a good old vanilla breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So three meals a day, that should be your starting point uh, because nearly all humans are physically hungry three times a day, whether they're athletes or not. Uh, however much they may train as athletes, you're likely to be physically hungry three meals today if you have normal sized meals. So that's your starting point. Now, some athletes do need to eat more often than that in order to meet their energy needs, in order to keep physical hunger uh, from becoming extreme between meals. So that's when snacks should be introduced. Don't snack if you don't, you know, don't snack between, say, lunch and dinner if you don't get physically hungry between lunch and dinner because. That's your way, body's way of telling you uh, through continued satiety that you don't need a snack. But if you can't get from lunch to dinner without a rumbling stomach, then do eat a snack. So you can snack as often as necessary uh, to avoid uh, you know, sustained physical hunger between meals. So it doesn't take too long you know, through your, just your, your routine as an athlete training a certain, uh, time, certain amount with a certain frequency uh, to figure out you know, how often you need to eat uh, in order to uh, manage physical hunger and supply uh, the amount of energy your body needs uh, without excess. Um, it is also a good practice, as, as all endurance athletes now know, I think, to eat and or drink soon after bigger workouts uh, by taking in especially carbs and protein and, of course, fluid for rehydration within an hour or so after. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to happen after every single workout, but definitely after those that are higher intensity or longer in duration. Um, if you do that, you will recover quickly, have a better workout the next day, and also it will tend to accelerate the overall fitness building process because uh, recovery and the physio physiological adaptations to training that make you uh, uh, a fitter athlete, those are largely over overlapping process. You, you become fitter by sort of over-recovering from workouts. So... Uh, that's an important element of nutrient timing as well. Um, also overlooked, um, what, what scientists found when they destroyed the myth that uh, eating frequently or grazing was the way to go, what they found was actually much more important was eating on a s consistent schedule. So, you know, there are a lot of people out there, especially people with, you know, very busy lives. You know, they may eat uh, lunch at noon one day, at 2 p.m. another day. That's just crazy hectic at work. And they might skip it, skip it entirely a third day. Um, and what happens when you do that, when you're, when you're on an erratic schedule in terms of when you're, you are eating, uh, your body, uh, kind of a hormonal panic switch is flipped, where your body doesn't ever know when the next meal is coming. So it kind of slows down metabolism and uh, causes your body to hold on to calories, to store calories as body fat. So even if the overall number of calories you eat averages out to be consistent. If you're getting those calories at different times from one day to the next to, to the next, you'll actually uh, you know, get fatter or fail to get leaner than you would if you took in the same number of calories on average, but on a very consistent schedule. So once you find the schedule that, that seems to work best for you as an athlete, try to eat on that schedule every day. Uh, you, know, you don't have to be completely anal about it, but it's really helpful uh, you know, to uh, eat the same day on Wednesday as you do on Saturday, schedule-wise. Um, and then more and more these days, I see athletes trying to get uh, too clever by half, get fancy with uh, nutrient timing, with practices such as uh, intermittent fasting, you know, where you eat only 500 calories on uh, Monday and Friday and eat normally the rest of the time, or you don't eat at all, uh, uh, for 16 hours a day and concentrate all your calorie intake during an eight hour period when you're awake and active. You know, all that stuff may, you know, help mar very marginally, but those aren't the heavy lifts. That, that stuff is not the stuff that most people need to do uh, to get, you know, 90% or even 100% of the way to their optimal racing weight. So that's kind of magic bullet stuff. And I see a lot of athletes who are doing basic things wrong who hope that by intermittent fasting, they can just you know, leap all the way from where they are to their optimal racing weight, and it never works out. So I'm not saying that everyone has to completely avoid some of the fancier methods of, of nutrient timing, but those should only come after you're already doing uh, the other things, the things, the bullet points that are higher on this list. Take care of those first, and then if you're not already at uh, where you want to be, then you can look at some of the, the fancier 
nutrient timing practices. So step four in uh, pursuing your optimal racing weight is self-monitoring. And this is a really uh, important point. So everything I've talked to talked about previously is just it's diet. This is more behavior. Um, it's, it's not about what you eat or when. Um, it's about tracking your progress. So there's plenty of research showing, for example, there was one study uh, in which uh, obese people were simply asked to write down everything they ate. And, and they were not asked to change their eating behavior at all. But guess what? Simply by writing down everything they ate, they lost weight because it made them more aware of what they were eating. It made them notice patterns that didn't make any sense. So they just kind of spontaneously, uh, you know, they wanted their food journals to look better, basically. And that inspired them to make small changes that made a difference in how much they weighed. So uh, it's kind of the opposite of the concept that the watched pot never boils. Um, you know, when you pay attention, you tend to do things differently. So you need to uh, pay attention to yourself as an athlete pursuing your optimal racing weight in relevant ways that will help you achieve that goal. So, uh, you know, what's the difference between relevant and not relevant? You know, there are certain things that you should monitor and other things that you need not monitor or at least need not often uh, monitor. So diet quality discussed previously is high on the list of things you should monitor. Again, I highly recommend that you down, let, download the... Uh, the DQS diet quality score smartphone app and get in the practice of uh, monitoring your diet quality. Um, just seeing that number uh, and seeing where the room for improvement is will naturally lead you uh, to make changes that improve your diet quality. Um, body weight obviously is, is an important one to monitor. So once a week or so, step on that bathroom scale um, because you don't know if the changes you are making to your, your diet and your training, which we'll discuss in a moment, you don't know if those changes are helping unless you measure relevant outcome variables such as body weight. Um, you want to see the number go down on the scale, assuming that you're currently carrying excess body fat. Uh, speaking of excess body fat, even more relevant because remember your optimal racing weight is defined by uh, your lowest realistically attainable healthy body fat percentage. So you want to measure your body fat percentage. Uh, there are a variety of ways to do that. The gold standard these days is the DEXA scan. It's the same medical instrument that's used to measure bone mineral density. Uh, those are highly accurate, um, but they're not very accessible uh, and they're expensive when they are accessible. Um, so just as a, a rough and dirty way to uh, get basically the same information, you can use one of those bio, bio impedance uh, scales like the Tanita, Tanita Ironman series. That's what I have. They're not as accurate, but they're accurate enough so that when you see trends, either up or down in your body fat percentage, you can trust that those are real trends. Even if the exact number you're seeing is not 100% accurate, um, the trends will be real trends. And so you want to see your body fat percentage go down as you're doing the things you're supposed to do to shed excess body fat. And then finally, and, and by no means least importantly, you want to regular, regularly monitor performance because again, I can't repeat this uh, point enough. Um, the point of losing uh, body fat as an endurance athlete is not to look good naked or not to achieve a certain number that you've decided uh, is the number you need to achieve. It's to perform better. So if you uh, make changes in your body weight and body fat percentage, that don't result in better performance, then you're not doing it right, or uh, you know the, or you've lost too much body fat percentage, for example. So uh, you know there are simple ways we all do it uh, in our training, kind of monitor performance. You can even insert sort of uh, regular performance tests in your training. I like what I call 95% time trials. Um, so you know once every few weeks, let's just say you're a runner, every few weeks you do. You know, a 10K warm up and run 10K uh, at, at a very high level of effort, but not quite a race level of effort. Do that every uh, five weeks or whatever, and you should see your times improving as you see improvements also in your body weight and body fat percentage. If you see that combined trend, then you know that the changes in body weight and body per fat percentage are actually uh, benefiting you and achieving uh, the, their uh, purpose for you as an endurance athlete. Um, if your performance goes down, even as your weight goes down, you're either losing too much weight or you're losing it in the wrong way. And then finally, in terms of things not to bother monitoring, 
calorie counting, as I suggested. Um, in special circumstances, uh, it's useful, especially in what I call a weight loss focus phase. So sometimes in the winter or right before you start a training cycle in the spring, if you have you know several pounds or a number of pounds that you need to lose, it's okay to count calories and reduce them in order to shed some pounds quickly before you turn your focus back to fitness development. But remember, maximum fat loss and maximum fitness gain are incompatible. So you wanna choose which one's more important. If uh, losing weight quickly is truly most important and you're not worried about build, building fitness right now, it's okay to count calories, you know, you know, reduce them by, you know, eat 500 calories per day less than your body needs to maintain your current weight. Uh, that will work, that will help you lose weight, but you wanna stop doing that and go back to mindful eating uh, once your attention turns back to performance. And then there's a national obsession with counting macronutrients, you know, is the optimal ratio, ratio 60, 20, 20, or some other thing, you know, the less carbs, the better, say a lot of people, um, you know, none of that actually is really uh, all that important if you're uh, maintaining a high quality diet. If your diet quality score is high and you're eating enough food without eating too much, I can guarantee that your macronutrient balance is not holding you back in any way. So you can just focus on diet quality, focus on eating enough but not too much, and never bother to count your macronutrients um, because there is no perfect um, macronutrient ratio. There's such a thing as too much or too little uh, for each of them, fat, fat, protein, and carbohydrate, but there are ranges. You know, you might, you might be able to function just as well at 70% uh, carbohydrate as at 50% as long as uh, you have a very high diet quality and you're getting enough food overall. So don't worry too much about your exact balance of macronutrients. So step five is training. We've talked about uh, diet. We've talked about sort of uh, behavioral management. That was the monitoring piece. And also, of course, training is uh, relevant to raising weight. And here's another topic where that really drives home the point that not all weight loss is good weight loss. So what the research shows is that if you want to train to get leaner and you're not interested in training to become a better endurance athlete, then the best way to train is to focus on high intensity interval workouts. So basically, go hard all the time uh, and don't bother with the, the long, uh, easy workouts and you will lose more uh, body fat than you would if you trained like uh, a normal endurance athlete. However, if your goal is actually to maximize your performance as an endurance athlete, you need to train in a very different way um, and you'll still get leaner, but instead of achieving you know, the leanest body fat percentage you could possibly get to, you'll actually achieve the body fat percentage uh, that's right for optimal performance as an endurance athlete, which again is the goal if you're an endurance athlete and not you know, a fitness contest uh, competitor. So what is the right way to train for optimal performance as an endurance athlete? It's the 80-20 uh, rule. So the 80-20 rule refers to the idea that, um, and again, this is science-based, it's also real world-based, um, if you look at uh, any elite endurance athlete in any discipline from rowing to cross-country skiing to swimming to cycling to triathlon uh, to running, they all do about 80% of their total training at low intensity uh, and 20% at moderate to high intensity. Uh, it just worked out that way over generations and generations of trial and error simply because that's what work be works best. And uh, now some, some very rigorous uh, formal scientific studies involving recreational endurance athletes have found that uh, even we mere mortal athletes also improve the most, get the fittest when we obey the same ratio, doing 80% of our training at low intensity, 20% at moderate to high intensity. Interestingly, while all elite endurance athletes follow the 80-20 rule, um, mostly unconsciously actually, uh, the typical recreational endurance athlete does more like of a 50-50 thing. We spend a lot of time at moderate intensity when we think we're at low intensity. Um, so uh, you'll um, achieve great benefits um, in terms of improving your fitness and performance if you fix that ratio, go from the typical 50-50 thing to actually slowing down a lot of the time and then speeding up a little bit of the time so that you hit that 80-20 ratio. Um, and most likely, you know, you will, you will, that, that's an effective way to get leaner. Again, 
the high intensity based training is the most effective way to get leaner, but it doesn't get you lean in a way that will actually improve you as an endurance athlete. So that's number one is obey the 80 20 rule. Also, it's helpful to polarize your training. And, and what polarized training means is that you either go hard or go home. So uh, the way the scientists measure it, there are basically three intensity buckets. There's low, moderate, and high. What the research is showing is that uh, you need to do 80% of your training in the low bucket, but that most of that remaining 20% should be in the high bucket versus in the moderate one. Uh, so polarized training means sort of avoiding the middle. You don't need to avoid it as much as possible, particularly because a lot of races actually occur at moderate intensity. And so you want to have uh, some familiarity with that, some level of uh, specific adaptation to moderate intensity. But overall, you want to polarize your training so that uh, you're either going really easy 80% of the time or mostly otherwise going uh, really hard at the other 20% of the time uh, and just sort of uh, making little forays into the moderate intensity bucket. Um, and then finally, uh, lifting heavy weights is a great way uh, to get leaner as an endurance athlete and to improve uh, as an endurance athlete. So we all know that you should uh, you know, hit the gym as an endurance athlete. Uh, lifting weights has been shown to uh, both enhance performance and reduce injury risk. Uh, but a third benefit is that it, all, it also helps athletes get leaner um, by uh, uh, sort of of course, the idea is not to bulk up, but you're never going to bulk up if you're running 60 miles a week and then lifting an hour a week in three 20-minute sessions. It's just not going to happen. Trust me, I've been training that way for years, and I couldn't be skinnier than I am. Uh, but a lot of athletes make the mistake of uh, going to the gym and choosing a weight that they can lift 20 times. Uh, that's not going to do it. You'll get marginal benefit from that. But you're already doing the endurance thing, so you don't want to lift weights in an endurance fashion. You want to go in there and get stronger uh, and add a little bit of um, energy hogging lean muscle mass to your body. So by doing that, um, you know, uh, muscle mass is a gas guzzler. So uh, even by adding a pound of muscle um, to your body, uh, you will increase your 24 hour resting metabolism. So basically the, the way I'd like to put it is that muscle eats fat. Uh, so lifting heavy weights, uh, it'll help you get injured less often. It'll uh, help you be more powerful on the bike or in the pool or up hills when you're running, uh, but it will also um, add a little bit of muscle to your frame that eats a little bit of the fat off your body and is kind of a, a final piece in the recipe for attaining your optimal racing weight. So we've covered our topic. Thank you very much. If you want to learn more about me, my website is mattfitzgerald.org, Twitter handle uh, mattfitwriter. Looks like I've dupl duplicated the website information there. And you can always find me, Team Iron Cowboy members, uh, on our site. So I hope you've gotten a lot out of this presentation. I enjoyed doing it. And uh, see you at the races.